Uh, very good. Can you guys see my screen and hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay, very good. Uh, yeah. So today's topic, uh, we're going to talk about user to data tracking. It's the ability to see who is accessing what kind of data um, both on the back end as well as access through applications and APIs. By way of introduction, my name is Brian Anderson. I've been with Imperva for about nine years. I work in our uh, Office of the CTO. I'm a Director of Technology here, working on several different innovation uh, initiatives, and happy to talk to you today about this uh, integrated solution that we have today. So to kind of paint the picture of the problem, if you will, um, you know, customers that have or organizations that process or house sensitive data uh, also have the burden of making sure that they store and process and manage that data in an appropriate manner. Uh, ideally, we'd like to secure that data. Nobody wants to be breached. There are some uh, regulatory compliance requirements to help us keep in line with how that data can be managed. Things like PCI, HIPAA, or SOX um, have some guidelines for uh, how to monitor uh, that data to protect it. Uh, but what we've seen from a trend perspective is that uh, organizations are still being breached. And the statistics are that, you know, it takes approximately 206 days to detect a breach and possibly 73 days to remediate that breach. And why is that the case? Uh, it's because, you know, we're seeing that there is additional complexity that's been introduced uh, into environments, uh, even though there is optimization that's introduced with things like virtualization, cloud native technologies, the decomposition from the monolithic application to microservices, uh, you know, container orchestration, and those sorts of things. Uh, now there is additional footprint for um, you know, people to access this data, and it's more difficult to monitor in that way. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about you know, the logs that are generated, but basically there's missing information if we're only looking at the back end of our systems at the databases in relation to the context of what users are touching that and how to uh, address or, or detect and remediate anomalous type of behavior or malicious uh, behavior. There is a Security Week article that we can share a link to um, that basically highlights in 2019 that uh, 15.1 billion records were breached, and of those, 13.5 billion came through uh, inadvertent exposure through applications and APIs. Now, this isn't necessarily OWASP uh, type of attacks where we exploit something with the web server or that's something, something of that level. It's more uh, in the realms of business logic attacks. It's more in the realms of misconfigurations, uh, you know, misconfigured API gateways or inconsistent security posture between APIs that are working together side by side. Uh, the Facebook breach is a great example where one API was, experienced, uh, was exposing profile data in a way that uh, wasn't intended. You know, I can click on show me my profile uh, according to what that user would see and then I would get access to all of that user's profile information. That was a difficult one to, uh, to track or detect because of the nature of the way that logs are generated and where users are coming from and lots of different APIs working together uh, that don't have a similar security posture. So um, moving on here, uh, you know, Imperv has always had a charter to protect sensitive data. Since its inception in 2002, we've always had this uh, initiative to protect sensitive data and the applications that access that data. So APIs and apps are different gateways or paths to that data, if you will. Um, and APIs, uh, the what we've seen as far as the additional complexity is that the more the APIs are introduced, the more that they're leveraged, again, which brings efficiency and optimization to environments, but there could be many different users that touch a single API uh, for different reasons. So it's important to understand, you know, who those users are that are there. Are they a technology partner? Are they a customer? Are they someone internal? Um, are they, uh, you know, what type of user are they accessing this API and ultimately the same data on the back end? Uh, so we have uh, two, two types of threats. Uh, there is an external threat and an internal threat. Uh, there could be people coming from the outside um, that are able to access your data in ways that, um, you know, that aren't intended if we don't have our, uh, our environment monitor, monitored correctly. But then we also have folks that are able to access uh, data from the inside. So it's important at each one of the tiers in our environment, both at the front door all the way through our application tier back to the back end of this that so we have appropriate monitoring. And it's also important that we have an ability to reconstruct or assemble uh, all of these logs that we have throughout our environment in a way that can give us a, uh, a full picture of what a transaction looks like or what kind of behavior that we're seeing from various users, both external and internal users, both database access as well as uh, through the application itself. 
Um, this is an example of a database activity monitoring log, a database log directly um, accessing the database itself. If I log in with like a SQL client like Toad or DataGrip or Oracle SQL Developer or whatever it is, um, I get simple information like here's the user, here's the source IP, here's the, you know, the object that was uh, accessed, and here's the query. Uh, maybe if somebody else logs directly into the database, maybe a, a business analyst logs in with a BI tool or something along those lines, I run some reports, I still see direct access information pretty straightforward. Um, but as soon as somebody comes through the application, uh, the application typically would have what's called a service account or a database user uh, within the application that makes uh, database queries on behalf of that application. But what's missing is who the user is on the front end of that. And again, we go back to if this is an API or if this is an application that has several types of users that may be uh, logging into this application to access this data. Um, in a financial example, let's say that it's a, um, it's a reporting service that accesses account information. It may be, in this case, John Smith represents a support person or it represents a customer or it represents an employee or it represents a technology partner. Um, interesting use cases you know, would be, you know, instead of being a direct customer of a bank, what if I'm Mint or Quicken that's logging in through what they call authorized aggregators, logging through a private connection, I still use those same credentials, but I don't go through the front door. Uh, so these are di examples of different types of users that may be accessing a service that at the database level, all that we would really see is activity from that service account on behalf of that application. So it's important to understand the context of who those users are and why they're there and how they got there. Um, be able to understand if that traffic originated from inside or outside the network. Uh, those are all relevant questions in relation to understanding who's accessing your data, specifically through applications and APIs as well. So that kind of creates the, the blind spot, if you will. Um, and then there's the complexity of, uh, we mentioned that, uh, you know, 200 some odd days to detect and then 73 days to uh, remediate or mitigate this, right? So this is an example of all of the different uh, logs or silos, if you will, uh, as it relates to people accessing data all the way from the outside back to the back end. So typically there is some kind of edge solution. Uh, it may be a you know, CDN or bot uh, mitigation or DDoS solution that's at the edge, maybe a combination of those technologies. And then ultimately that scrubs out uh, the automated and malicious traffic that we have at the edge, which is a large chunk of, of internet traffic. And then we have the application silos. And we'll call that uh, the application silos can be very complex. It can be made up of you know, microservices, uh, everything from serverless to, to monolithic applications that are all working together. Uh, one financial customer that I was working with had 42 different services that were involved uh, in processing a single transaction. So there can be, it can be very complex in the application silo in itself. But then we access back to the database silo where applications are making queries or, uh, or accessing these databases, and that's a different set of logs. And so we're going through context that I have at the edge, context that I have within the application, and context that I have back at the database level. And typically we would then forward these on to uh, a SIM product somewhere or even a UEBA type of product. Uh, but just because we have all these logs in one place doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy for me to detect uh, something that is um, uh, something that's anomalous or something that's malicious right out the gate because of the complexity of the sheer amount of logs that I have, uh, as well as what it takes to kind of put this together into one picture. Uh, so in my previous experience working with customers, um, when they experience something that's you know, anomalous or a questionable uh, transaction in the environment, um, there's a process that they go through to say, okay, get everybody from each one of these uh, technologies represented in this picture together on a phone call and let's start ruling things out. Uh, we need to quantify what we just saw. What kind of breach is this? What kind of impact do we see? So then a few phone calls are made and we get uh, everybody that represented, including vendors such as Imperva and, and load balancing and networking and you know, you got your, your development groups, you have your database groups, you've got Everybody gets on a call and you start ruling things out together, but this requires, hey, the database team, we saw it come from here. What applications are accessing that database? Let's make another call to up, okay, who's protecting these at the edge? What edge solution are they going through? What pops are we looking at and that sort of thing? So it's kind of a backtrack. So this is a very complex process if we see something to reconstruct this story, if you will, or get everybody together and uh, rule out and uh, define what is, what is impacted or quantify that uh, potential issue there, potential incident. Um, so every, every organization has, by nature of technology, 
uh, this blind spot because there is always going to be an application tier that's accessed in this data, and we always have the requirement to secure that data. Uh, you know, part of that is guided by regulatory requirements like PCI, SOX, and HIPAA, and so forth. But then we also have security requirements that complement that to say, look, I don't want to get breached. I don't want to. Uh, we, we need to make sure that we monitor who's accessing this data appropriately. And the, by nature of technology, the fact that these logs are disconnected means that we have some effort to reconstruct or put this back together in that way. And we're hoping to, we're looking to address that very issue with uh, the portfolio of security offerings that, that Imperva can provide. And so, again, we're looking to protect your data and all paths to that data. Uh, we call this comprehensive edge-to-end protection or user-to-data tracking. Essentially, there is a security framework that, um, that Imperva has uh, kind of used as a guideline here for protecting your sensitive assets. Uh, on the database side, this has started with you know, discovery. Um, what, data, what data do you have and what databases do you have in your environment? And so there's an exercise where we help to discover what database services are there. Uh, we also can help quantify or classify uh, which of those databases are in scope. Are they sensitive or not? And you know, the, the analogy is we don't watch every channel on TV. Um, we certainly don't want to capture every single audit event in our environment because that's not useful. Uh, it bloats the infrastructure. and we need, to, we need to be targeted and refined in the way that we monitor our environment to include only what is in scope. right? And then after we understand how many databases that we have, Maybe there's a thousand out there, and maybe only a hundred are sensitive. Now I can focus my resources. Let's assess whether or not those things are vulnerable. So there's a there's a notion of vulnerability assessment. Once we understand what assets we have and and uh, you know the controls around those things, we can start to put in policies to say who should have access to this or who's doing what with these assets. Uh, that's where we introduce you know some auditing. Uh, policies to see what kind of privileged operations are being performed, who's selecting my PCI data, HIPAA data, who's modifying my, uh, my sensitive tables, et cetera. Um, and then there's a notion of reporting, uh, kind of an ongoing process. So uh, if, you've, if you've gone through this exercise for an audit, um, typically there's a lot of effort to go through that. And then if it's not an automated process, that falls back the way things were, like a waterfall kind of approach. So we need to have this be an automated life cycle of new introduced databases in the environment. They have some mechanism to be able to continuously perform this kind of life cycle around managing that sensitive data. Uh, but the biggest part here is that the applications that access that data need to be a part of this picture, which is kind of what we're talking about today. Um, so in this is kind of a... Um, a slide that kind of includes everything that Imperva has to offer. At the edge, we do offer edge security, uh, DDoS, CDN, web application firewall. Within the network, um, we also have web application firewall. Uh, we have advanced bot protection. Um, and we have, by way of acquisition uh, in the last two years, um, acquired a runtime application self-protection solution um, that can help protect the application itself. And uh, this is one of the ways that we're able to get the context uh, that we are looking for from who's accessing your data from within the application itself. Uh, and then we have data security offerings on the back end to help you see who's monitoring that. Uh, but essentially, um, going back to the slide of all paths to your data, uh, looking at things all the way from the edge all the way down to the back end, we can deploy uh, at each part of this environment. Um, so if you were to have the appropriate information on the back end and you say, I saw a user do something inappropriate, uh, Imperva provides the ability to remediate at each tier in this environment. So I can block at the application level, block at the edge level, and block also at the database level. That, that would be the, the best case scenario. Um, but just to share what kind of attributes you get from a database activity monitoring event here, we see in the middle, we saw those audit records. Um, we have a database username, uh, the database name, uh, the query name, the table name, et cetera. What we're missing in that story is app attributes that come from the application itself, like the username specifically, the role of the user, the stack trace, the file name and line number, the source IP address. Um, are you a bot or not? Are you coming from inside the network or outside the network? Uh, these are things that, are, that really can only be seen if you look at um, upstream traffic because the database doesn't see that information directly, right? And this is what we're looking to put together. Uh, so what we have here is uh, our runtime application self-protection solution, and not to get too nerdy here, but uh, has the ability to enrich your queries that leave your application. And so this is an example of a query that has left an application where RASP is installed performing something called query enrichment. And it basically takes everything that it sees in clear text and memory, because it's already loaded in the runtime of the application, and it appends that to the query in the form of a comment. So it's benign to the database. The database doesn't care. But what this enrichment has in it 
is a lot of really interesting information. Meanwhile, the, the query executes in the application of the database the same way that it normally would. And this is dynamic in that no configuration changes are necessary within the application itself. For all the environments that RASP supports, which is uh, Java, .NET, uh, .NET Core, and Node.js, we have the ability to deploy and enrich these queries. What that query looks like is, again, we're looking back to the database username, uh, the database name, the object table, uh, table name, the source IP, that sort of thing. Directly at the database, we understand what those records look like. Um, this is some of the information that's added to the query directly from the application itself that is visible in clear text within the application. Again, it doesn't matter what kind of authentication is used. It could be federated SAML. It could be LDAP. We don't really care because in the runtime of the application, all that is available in clear text and memory, which RASP has full visibility to. So it takes all those attributes that it has access to, including we see in here session attributes, uh, you know, again, file name, line number, stack trace, where, what the original URL was of this request, and all those, all those relevant bits of information, and it enriches that query directly with that information. Now, to take that a step further, we also have the ability to ingest upstream headers. Upstream headers could be things like client classification, are you a bot or not? What kind of browser are you, uh, you know, um, you know, Selenium or whatever it is? Uh, and then, you know, where you are coming from the world, so long lat values. Um, the reputation of that network, uh, the route that you took to get there, which pops are you coming from, or are you coming from inside the network? Do you not have any of these attributes with it? And so we can quickly detect or uh, depict which, why, you know, what kind of route you took to access the application to begin with. And then lastly, we also have the ability to enrich this with data classification information. So I mentioned as a part of our data uh, security framework, one of the very first steps is to classify a database to see whether or not it's in scope. Where is my sensitive data? Of these thousand databases, I have a hundred that are sensitive, and here's the tables that are that I need to focus my time on or prioritize because they're sensitive, and here's the uh, here's the type of data that resides there. And so let's talk a little bit about what we can do with this data as we go into kind of a demo of um, these solutions kind of working together. Uh, what we're looking at here is an application that is hosted in Amazon. Um, it's a containerized application just for, just for fun, but it sits behind our, our, our Cloud WAF environment. So we have edge detection, if you will, and then we uh, have RASP deployed within the application itself. This sends traffic back to a MySQL database that's monitored by our database activity monitoring platform. Uh, and so everything that happens at the back end of this database or of this application, we should be able to see. Um, but let's log into this. It's, it's not a very complex application. Uh, it doesn't do that much, but we do have some uh, sensitive uh, records that are in here. So there's account information, uh, there's credit card information. Um, you know, just for simplistic sake, let's do one little uh, balance transfer here. And then let's see what happens on the back end of this. So I've completed a transaction. Uh, what we're doing is, again, we're sending this data, um, or these queries go into a database on MySQL, monitored by database activity monitoring, and with that query enrichment there. And then we're dumping that directly into a, um, a, an open source SIM product. This is uh, referred to as an ELK platform. Elastic is the database, Logstash is the parsing component, and then um, Kibana is the front end visualization. But just to be clear, this could be done by any kind of data visualization tooling. Um, this is not unique to ELK. This is just a prototype of dashboards you can uh, put together with the unique data that, uh, that we've assembled. But basically, this enrichment is kind of what we're highlighting here of what's valuable about, uh, about seeing all these things together in, uh, in one query, in one, in one payload, if you will. So if I were to go down to, let's get the last 90 days here. Um, one of the visualizations we put together here is being able to take a look at that application user. So I see lots of users that have logged into the application. Um, let's go back to our last 15 minutes here, and I could see specifically my, uh, my information coming from North America. Um, you know, we do see the URLs that were accessed. Um, in here, I see what operations that are performed against the database, uh, the service types, uh, MySQL in this case, browser, Firefox, which is what I'm using. And then I see the queries that were executed down below. And so I could say, I want to see anybody that touched the transactions table. Um, I could see what those queries were. Um, I could see if I wanted to go to the balance transfer URL, I can then run filters to say, I now know that anybody that touched a balance transfer table uh, from this particular URL, these are the queries that were executed back at the database level. Um, so it's interesting to be able to put that together. But again, you have to ask the question, so what? Why do I care about this? Uh, well, what makes us care about this is if this is a sensitive transaction or not. We go back to our classification process of understanding, is this something that's 
uh, in scope? Do I care about these records and why? Uh, this little link here, this database link, will take us over to a classification page that tells us whether or not we care about that and why. So if this is sensitive data that resides in these tables, and I do know the date that it was discovered, uh, whether or not it was a name-based search, or if it was a content-based search, whether or not it's the records that are stored within that table, or if it's just a naming convention that deems that to be sensitive. Um, I have all the different attributes and information that I need to know about the database to tell me whether or not this is relevant for me to, to pay attention to. So uh, as, as you know, common phrase is the, the better input you have, uh, the better output you're going to have. Uh, there's this notion of um, it taking, or, or statistics point to it takes 200 plus days to detect a breach. Part of that is because it's difficult to track um, all these attributes together in the same place. Uh, and so, again, with the increasing complexity of microservices, uh, new cloud native technologies, the complexity of application architecture, even though they do bring a lot of efficiency and cost reduction and, you know, CI, CD and software development lifecycle efficiency, they do introduce complexity. And so it's important to be able to uh, reconstruct these transactions and see all of this in, in one pane of glass, so to speak. So the difference here is, you know, if we have something like an APM agent, uh, an application performance monitoring agent that maybe has similar access, similar visibility to all of these transactions, the sheer amount of data that we're talking about to be able to re reassemble this or reconstruct this is significant. And what we have uh, with the approach that we're looking at here is specifically a refined, uh, you know, set of logs that can already look for this is a sensitive audit record. And for any time somebody, and anytime somebody touches my database that I already know that this is a sensitive audit record, that this is in scope, that I want to monitor this, I can rule out a lot of the benign application traffic and only focus on things that are relevant for me. So if I, if I see a bunch of queries going off against the database, that might not mean that I want to write every one of those to disk and study them in the SOC. But if I see something that has maybe some conditions like, uh, more than one record leaving a credit card table, or maybe more than a thousand records over a certain period of time, or uh, maybe login events from one user logging in from 50 different locations. If I have that long lap value uh, process to, uh, to key off of here, those attributes, I can then combine this data together to then uh, create some really refined security policies to detect these things in a more effective manner. So. This is how we can track users from, uh, from the outside world or through the application touching the database. Uh, this is how we can tell you whether or not those queries are, are relevant uh, in relation to classification. We can, uh, we can identify the, what those are. Uh, we also have the same concept that we introduced for, uh, for data assessment. So vulnerability assessment data, are my databases uh, vulnerable or not? When somebody touches that database, you know, I can answer questions like, has a bot ever touched uh, a sensitive database in my environment? This gives us that ability to, um, to, to, to detect that, but then also I can determine whether or not my uh, databases are vulnerable or not. Um, do I have misconfigurations at the database level, and are there patches that are missing and so forth? Um, so from an edge-to-end -end perspective, that's, uh, that's most of um, how we can help to reconstruct or paint that picture. Uh, lastly, I'll just dive right into one of these audit events here that has this combined context. Um, again, at risk of getting too nerdy here, um, this is what one of those payloads looks like. Here's the classification information that I mentioned. Uh, here is um, the application name. Here we have standard audit information, but in this I.O. section we refer to as in Provo 1, we have our session attributes here. Uh, we have our, our stack trace, uh, you know, the, um, the file name and line number, and then here's our headers that come in, all, again, this is all within a single payload. So there's no reconstruction, there's no correlation, there's no post-processing to try to say, hey, did these happen during a certain time to, to try to you know, put logs together? This is in a single payload and, and every single time somebody touches your database, I now have full upstream context to identify whether or not they came from inside or outside the network, whether or not you're a bot, I know exactly who the application owner is that I, that I can go to if I'm the SOC and I support thousands of applications. I can then uh, go directly within the organization to get resolution to potential anomalous issues. Um, but that's the big value proposition here is being able to tie that together. Um, so that's most of the, uh, the content that I had prepared for today around user-to-data tracking and edge-to-end uh, protection. I guess uh, now is a good time to probably open up for, for questions or thoughts if anybody uh, has anything that they'd like to ask. Yeah, Brian, I, I don't see any questions as of yet, but we can do one of two things, or uh, if you do have a question, you can either unpause your, or uh, mute yourself and then ask it, or you could actually put it on the chat. 
can I ask for a prem, uh, a, a on-prem question for Dan? Sure, absolutely. You can ask an on-premise Dan question. Yep. Sabik, did, did you want to um, unmute yourself or did you just want to ask it uh, on the chat? Uh, hello? Yes. yes. Can you mm -hmm. hear me? Hi, we can hear you. Uh, hello. I was actually more interested uh, if we have a deploy deployment only agent and I want to make an user application user tracking and I have a case uh, that is not configured very well. And I was interested on how the agent does the enrichment or how, how can you help me? <laughs> that, that's a great question. So if you already have database activity monitoring installed today, um, you don't need to do anything on the database activity monitoring side. Just for the, just for the context for everyone on the call, we had a feature and we had uh, in a t previous attempts at trying to track this edge to end through something called uh, universal user tracking or application user tracking. This is where, <coughs> excuse me, at the database level, we would be looking for an initialization query and trying to track the user that way. That is no longer necessary. Uh, the approach that we're talking about now is you can simply install a very lightweight query enrichment agent in the application itself. And the query enrichment agent will add all of this context directly to your database traffic as it stands today. So you don't need to change anything with DAM at all. Uh, you just simply put something in your application that will add this context uh, directly to the query itself. And then all of a sudden you'll have all of this enrichment directly in the query. Now, database activity monitoring is already picking up those queries. So we're already auditing those events. All we need to do is put that, um, put the query enrichment agent in your application, and then all of this context will be passed down to the database. Does that make sense? Um, yes, I actually tried. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Just a Okay. Sabi, you were saying Sorry. you had another question? Uh, yes, I tried SQL user tracking, but uh, it does not enrich very well the data, or at least uh, it's not punctual as the client expected. Uh, right. Uh, are you talking about uh, under policies, enrichment, application user configuration? So what I'm referring to is, is installing uh, a RASP or a query enrichment agent within the application itself. This isn't something that we're going to be configuring right inside of database activity monitoring. Um, to your point, SQL user tracking, as we refer to it, um, isn't effective for things like pooled connections or it's challenging to manage. This is a new version of being able to detect uh, user data or users accessing your, uh, your data from directly within the application itself. So if you already have database activity monitoring deployed, leave it there. You can let it sit there. You don't need to change anything about it. What we're discussing here is installing an agent in your application service itself, right inside the application within the runtime. And what that agent is going to do within the application, uh, it's, it's going to enrich your queries. So that will add in, before the query leaves the application itself, it's going to add in this context in all of those queries. So your database activity monitoring platform will pick up a query that has this enrichment at the end of it. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. we have a, a few more questions. And Sabi, thanks so much for that question. Um, mm -hmm. Shamel says, how can this data, uh, data be used for fraud detection? Well, I think that any time you have, uh, like, you know, the, the, the comment is, you know, the, more, the better input you have, the better output you have. You certainly can uh, help to contribute to uh, fraud detection by being able to reconstruct your transactions. And when I say reconstruct them, it's uh, looking at all the upstream edge attributes, the application attributes, as you see um, transactions that are processed at the database level. If you have this level of visibility, knowing where the user logged in from, uh, knowing what kind of client it was, and even, uh, even more so knowing that if I'm using the service account in a way that uh, is not intended to, so if I don't have these attributes, that's a way for me to create a positive security model around restricting people that don't come through the application. Uh, if I have all these attributes together in the data that I have to work with, it certainly can contribute to being able to detect fraudulent transactions. Um, we're not uh, proposing this necessarily as a sole fraud solution, but being able to see all these things together and reconstruct those transactions can certainly be very helpful in the, in the realms of fraud. Cool, and, 
if there's other questions about that, then just post them there. Uh, John Lee has uh, a question. Is there any performance impact on the application transaction by leveraging RASP? Uh, that's a great question. So the way that we're deployed, and the answer is no. Uh, we've been uh, we've been deployed for several years at extremely large retailers uh, through multiple years of Black Friday on production applications. RASP runs within the uh, within the application um, in the runtime itself, and it doesn't use signatures. Just a little bit more about our RASP technology. Uh, it implements uh, something called LangSec or language theoretical security, and it basically will look at inbound parameters and uh, see if there are things like tautologies present, like OR1 equals 1. Are there conditions in there? From a language perspective, it analyzes what's, what's coming in. So it doesn't need to reach out to a management server, or it doesn't need to apply a bunch of signatures at runtime. And for that reason, uh, there, is no, uh, there is no performance impact um, or a very, very, very negligible minimal performance impact for, uh, for running RASP within your application. Additionally, what we're proposing here is um, only the query enrichment feature for that. So it's a very lightweight uh, capability that anytime the application um, reaches out to the database, we simply just add the context that we see within the application to that. But RASP is very lightweight. It can operate in an air-gapped environment uh, with no network connectivity at all. There's a config file that you upload with the application that you could turn things on and off. Uh, and then it initializes with the class loader in, in the, into the runtime of the application. And that's how, that's how RASP is able to operate. But uh, negligible uh, performance um, uh, within the application when you run that. And for that reason, uh, or just on that note, when the way that we install, we can then deploy with any kind of application that you have. So may it be a legacy uh, monolithic application, if it's something that's running on you know, instances in the cloud, if it's containerized, uh, and even now we support serverless, uh, Lambda, uh, for Node.js, so that's a direction that we're trying to help um, as, you know, monitor the serverless applications as well, or serverless functions as a service. Uh, so these are things you can incorporate with, with the RASP technology, giving you that same level of visibility there. Yeah, it was an excellent question, Brian. I've heard that question asked a few times from other customers, so uh, great question there. We, we have another one. Uh, what will be the risk of having this agent installed on your application? So the, the whole purpose of the RASP technology is to reduce risk, actually. So that um, even though we're able to get insights from what the RASP agent is able to see, uh, the primary function of RASP is to protect the application against application-level attacks, right? So even though we have, <laughs> we have our web application firewall and DDoS and stuff at the edge, certain problems are meant to be dealt with over the network, like volumetric type of attacks, business logic type of attacks. Maybe you want to take this traffic and route you to a honeypot or don't let you touch the application server, but certain things can only be seen from within the application, like command injection, deserialization attacks, and that sort of a thing, right? So we protect at the last tier, uh, which is within the app. You know, 80% of the code that you have within an application is something that we didn't write ourselves. They're frameworks, libraries. Maybe it's a third-party app that we can't control the code and we can't fix. So organizations find themselves with their hair on fire running around trying to fix um, vulnerabilities that are discovered within your applications. And RASP can help you run secure by default. So it automatically mitigates all of these vulnerabilities that you have in your code, protecting your application, uh, but then also gives us some insight, uh, like this query enrichment that you can feed into your database activity monitoring solution on the back end. So if anything, uh, RASP would absolutely reduce the risk. Uh, if you look at the, um, the, uh, the single runtime application self-protection magic quadrant that was created by uh, Gartner that only happened for one year, and then they're now, now shifting RAS to be a part of a bigger API security or application security kind of portfolio magic quadrant. But for the one year they did have that magic quadrant, uh, the Previty technology, which is our rep, uh, RASP technology that Imperva acquired two years ago is all the way at the top right for all the reasons that I've described. LangSec, uh, the design of operating in, a, um, in, a, in an air gap environment, and the ability to mitigate all of these things in, in a very effective manner. Yeah, I, one thing I love about Brian's answers, they're very detailed, so appreciate that. <laughs> um, so is query enrichment agent part of DAM, or do we need to buy some additional licenses? Uh, we're working with our licensing group to to try to find a way to package this with our with our database activity monitoring offering. Um, I, as of today, I think it's still something that can be purchased as a as a separate item. But very soon, we will be uh, coming out with a way to package this together with our uh, database activity uh, activity monitoring offering. Just the query enrichment capability to to complete this story. But it's a great question. 
and I'm looking forward to those pricing updates as well. Yeah, it is a good question. Um, and then, can RASP work third-party DAM tools? So RASP uh, is, um, it can load with a runtime for Java-based applications, uh, .NET, .NET Core, and Node. So if those applications have a runtime that uses Java, .NET, .NET Core, or Node.js, um, then yes, we can, we can work with those of specific versions or whatever, which we try to maintain. Um, everything that we would see in production is what we try to maintain support for. Uh, so extremely old versions of Java, if they're end of life, then they might not be on that list. But apart from that, if they're in those runtimes, then uh, we certainly can look to support those with, uh, with RASP. Okay. One last question, unless some uh, come in, so feel free to start adding the questions now. But do you mean it, uh, let me try to read this as best I can. Do you mean it cloud work as virtual patching? It could work as virtual patching. So virtual patching is if I have a vulnerability in the application itself um, and someone can exploit that if they know about that, uh, and we have a technology that runs within the application that has the ability to block that, uh, it means that the code isn't necessarily fixed, but it's virtually patched because we have the ability to mitigate that. RASP can absolutely be a virtual patching solution that secures your application by default, mitigates all the known exposures or unknown exposures as well. It blocks zero-day attacks uh, like struts and everything else without any configuration changes. It can certainly virtual patch both your uh, custom-developed applications, third-party applications, and the like. Great. And, you know, this webinar um, is somewhat, I wouldn't say similar, but uh, there was a webinar on kind of the roadmap and all things about RASP that uh, Raj, our product manager, uh, is focused on, that particular product. So if you hadn't had a chance to listen to that particular webinar, um, and on the follow-up, once I get this, I'll make sure to add that webinar on there, but I think there'll be some interest on, uh, with this group for that. Um, if there are no other questions, I'll give it, you know, I'll, I'll stay on another minute or two, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and just let you go, let everybody go, but want to thank you all so much for, uh, for participating, for asking the questions. Brian, I mean, you are a super fast talker, but get tons of content in there. I think it was awesome. I mean, this stuff, uh, uh, what you're presenting and what you're showing and, and, and just uh, the information that uh, you're giving to our customers, I think is very uh, helpful and very good. And, and again, most people like it or know that I like it whenever you put your thank yous, very informative, or hey, let's try this or let's try that. So please feel free to add those into the, the chat. But so one comment I would have for the group is, first of all, thank you so much for, for coming. Thank you for your engagement and all your questions. Uh, my talking fast is my ultimate downfall, but I, uh, I constantly work <laughs> on it. I have a sign that says slow down. But uh, if there are other suggestions for <laughs> webinar content that you guys are interested in. If you want us to come up with something or help speak to uh, something, um, please you know, feel free to, to reach out. We were happy to put together um, you know, content on specific topics. You want to see an integration. You want to see you know, even a, a co-presented thing with maybe a technology partner and how we can work together. Please do reach out, and we're happy to put together additional content for you. Well, and, and this hasn't been posted yet, and maybe I'll just let the cat out of the bag here. Um, Brian, you are going to present in early November uh, around ServiceNow, and ServiceNow has accepted um, the invite to show up and help. Kind of, uh, I don't know if you want to quickly say something about that, but uh, uh, sure. So we, we, absolutely. So we do have an upcoming webinar on how we can integrate with and work with the complementary technology ServiceNow. They are an ITSM or um, IT service management uh, automation platform. They basically bring the automation of services, uh, of processes, uh, to, um, uh, to your environment. And what we have is sensors and information. So we have information that's actionable, and they provide the process and workflow and escalation and assignment uh, to that. So change control reconciliation, when I created change control, um, that workflow all the way from seeing that happen at the database level, modifying that, and then going back into updating my change control tickets with those queries. We're going to talk about how we can natively integrate with, uh, with ServiceNow and, and similar technologies like that and how that can bring a lot of value and efficiency into your environments. <laughs>